Hey, Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's uh, 86 degrees in Seattle today. It's got sun in the forecast. I saw some clouds for this weekend, of course, of course, but I think we've got our guaranteed fine weather for the next 20 days or so. So yeah, things are going well in the fair city of Seattle. And I'm delighted to see that you all look healthy and wealthy and wise up in Alaska landings. How's it yes. going there? It's hot here. The sun's shining and it's actually wearing t-shirts and shorts and it's been very nice. Yeah, we're competing with you all for the fair weather game here. And I, we've, we've got a strong competitor going on right here. <laughs> Did you slap on some deodorant, Leonard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> TMI. All right. Look at that ass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, have we started the webinar. No, I'm just kidding. I know we have. Of course we have. Hi, everybody. This is Peter Schrappen, your your co-host here for Seattle Boat Show Live. Get a the, the distinct pleasure to join you each Thursday evening from seven to eight or so when we get delighted by a special guest. And we've got a special guest this evening, which we'll get to in a little bit, but we uh, skip the intro to get right into the meat of the matter. There's Mark Wenzel. Hey, Mark, how's it going? It's going great, Peter. I'm here in sunny Port Ludlow. You can see the sun streaming in. I'm sitting up at the marina's brand new uh, social deck. It's uh, beautiful, beautiful new furniture. Of course, overlooking the marina, it's great. And uh, 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 I've been Port Townsend yesterday and and prior to that, back in Honor Quarters and tomorrow, Pleasant Harbor. So we're getting the whole thing in here to uh, update the Wagner Guide and say hello to everybody out here. Awesome. And Mark, is it just bustling in Port Ludlow? Those are words that don't normally go together, but what's the activity like? Well, well at, the, at the moment, it's bustling with a whole group of people going by. Five minutes ago, we had a whole group of pirates go by, about 50 of them, and wenches, real wenches. And they're uh, out uh, to the uh, Lady Washington, which is out at the end of the dock here. So quite a bit of excitement here in Port Ludlow. Nice, nice. And Landon's, how are you doing up in Alaska? Hey, fabulous right now. The weather has been great. The rain, the rain quit here about three or four days ago, and we've been entertaining some family members. We were just over to Goddard Hot Springs and came back, and uh, so it's been wonderful. So son and grandchildren, they're having a great time learning the history of Sitka and of Alaska and, and, uh, and just enjoying the being out on the boat. And are, are they getting the city to themselves, given that the cruise ships haven't been uh, as present as in past years? Actually, the first cruise ship arrived yesterday. So, second. Uh, second, so, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, and... and uh, unfortunately, they a little bit of uh, a little bit of a COVID out outbreak here, so a few things have been closed down. But the majority of it is still open, and uh, indeed, there are a few more people here with cruise ships now. I see, I see. Well, th that's great to see you all. I was just going to mention a brief little legislative update before this meeting. I was part of a community organizing group of coalition, a new coalition to save the Seattle Harbor Patrol. You might have heard that their funding is in jeopardy. So we had about fifty organizations and attendees on that zoom and if you'd like more information on that just hit me up in the chat and i can send you some info on that and i'll put the letter that we wrote to the seattle city council as they look at for whatever reason axing that important program i don't want to be too dramatic they're not going to be axing it but they're looking at the funding piece of it and maybe moving over to fire but anyway we have enough concerns and we're trying to build a coalition here so i had that going on this afternoon and we'll continue to write herd on that as they say in texas um so yeah, but there was a Como story on it last evening. I will put that in the chat when I start when I stop babbling, and as well as the letter that we sent to Seattle City Council. So that's my that's my update, Mark Bunzel. Well, uh, I should add that uh, the big news is uh, what uh, the, or I should say the question. Just ten minutes ago, somebody walked up. I was setting up for the show tonight. She said, "I know who you are. You're Mark. That guy, Mark something, and and." You know the deal with the Alaska border. The truth of the matter is, I don't know. August 9th, we've been told the border will open up to boating. We are, have not been told how or what the process will be. And, and we believe there's quite a bit of confusion on this, that uh, the reason we don't know is they're trying to invent this. It's harder to open up the border than it is to shut the border. Uh, so we're all going to be patient and wait for the Canadian authorities to come up with a a procedure and process that's safe and or we'll report on it as quickly as we can. Leonard Lorena, do you have any new information? 
Yeah, we do. We have spoken with uh, oh. Prince Rupert. They pretty much say the same thing that uh, uh, for vaccinated Americans, you can come in uh, land, air, and by boat. However, uh, CBSA, they're still figuring out the procedure for boaters. It's a lot easier for land and air, and they need to um, train those folks that will be uh, checking you when you come in by boat. So the training is going on, the procedures are being figured out, and Prince Rupert tells us they don't even won't know until probably August 8th. So we are staying tuned and keeping in touch with as many folks as we can. And just to elaborate on that, the proceed, one of the procedures that uh, came up in this, the, apparently uh, that part of uh, vaccinated Americans are gonna be able to come through on August 9th. Uh, and part of that procedure is you have to come with a, a negative COVID test and you have to come with a quarantine plan uh, just in case they, you need a quarantine. And in addition to that, the entry point officers, CBSA officers, are supposed to be doing random testing, uh, random COVID testing at the border when people are coming through. And that, hap that apparently is one of the issues that uh, marine or mar boat entry points uh, need to come up with a plan for that. Uh, the CBSA officer officers need to be trained about how to take those random samples and then what do you do with the samples? How do they get processed? Uh, and what do you do with the individuals? I, I assume that's part of what they're doing. So uh, back to what Mark said, that indeed opening up the border is a whole lot more complex than closing it at this point. And we do understand you must use the Arrive Can app to put in your proof of vaccinations uh, and also bring the original cards with you. And just to, uh, there's a, continues to be confusion about the Arrive Can app. The Arrive Can app, uh, is not a CBSA app. That's a public health authority, a, a Canadian public health authority app. And it's there to track and keep track of individuals during quarantine uh, and also to register a quarantine plan with them. They, it's, uh, the app gets connected with CBSA quite often, <laughs> quite often because the, uh, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the, That's a ringtone uh, there, Leonard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it gets connected with CBSA because the CBSA agents are responsible for uh, taking for uh, checking to make sure that you had an Arrive Can app or that you filled out your Arrive Can app and that you have a plan for quarantine. So it keeps getting connected, but those two are totally separate. And again, the Arrive Can app is just the public health authority. Sorry about that call. <laughs> <laughs> Never new happened to me before. That's new information. Yeah. Just a hot break. That's right. Take there. that call. They're calling us. <laughs> That's right. Um, I would mention too that CBSA has voted to go on strike, which is another kind of wild card, another development that's happened yesterday. I'll put an article in the chat as well. So it's a lot of moving pieces here. We did get a question in the chat. It was, uh, one second as I scroll up. What do you know about US citizens going to Canada and threatening and then returning to the US? Any issues with US customs? So we hit the CBSA, but what do you know about? You know, my, let's see if I can take a stab at this one. It's my understanding, and this might have been through a previous webinar that Seattle Vote Show Live, that because of the Jones Act, when you're going home, it's okay if you're a US citizen. If you're making your return home to the US and you, that there's a lot of deference paid by uh, U.S. Customs when that happens. Is that accurate? Does that line up with what you know? Uh, that that is that is accurate. Uh, they they do give you deference to going home, but they, uh, for example, the question we're getting asked by people calling in or sending emails is, okay, I'm coming down from Alaska, and we turn the clock. Uh, and it goes past August 9th. Now, can I break off and go to the Broughtons or go to Destination Sound? And from what we understand, and this is pure speculation, if you have gone ahead and been cleared for an exit, uh, I mean, a uh, transit passage, uh, you'll need to complete your passage before turning around and going back up to Canada. So we don't know that they've come up with a way of dealing with that. And we, I tend to doubt they will just because of the complications. Our understanding is that you may, even after August 9th, still do the transit through or the pass through. We have talked with some folks who are like us in Alaska coming back 
and they're planning to get their COVID test in Ketchikan at the airport. Apparently it's for free and it is accepted by Canada. Uh, and you talked with those folks too, right? Yeah, so there are apparently two places in, uh, okay. potentially in Ketchikan that we understand might have COVID tests available. Uh, one of them is at the airport. The other one is reportedly uh, going to be set up or has been set up at the Alaska Marine Line, uh, um, uh, Alaska Marine Line on the uh, Ketchikan side of that. So not the uh, uh, not the ferry terminal, but the Alaska Marine Line uh, location, which is uh, fairly near or very close to north uh, uh, to Bar, Bar Harbor. And so that's our understanding right now. But again, I, our recommendation is, you know, check the CBSA website. Make sure you're looking at the CBSA website. There's about three others that are uh, Canadian. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, Discover, or no, Tour uh, Canada, I think it is, that has some information. And there's also the Public Health Authority uh, website. And they have different information, but again, the authoritative, authoritative source is going to be CBSA, of course. Thanks, so, I think uh, yeah, thank you. I think it's pronounced Bahaba, but I hear you. Yeah, there's just a whole lot of stuff. There's a lot of change going on right now. I'll put the CBSA website in the chat as hopefully you're checking that, everyone at home, as you go along with tonight's show. Any other questions in the chat as I scroll up here? Um, I don't. Oh, what type of COVID test is getting requested? Molecular. Molecular, thanks. Not the rat. They will not accept the rapid. Okay, good and to know. Apparently the ones that we talked about in Catch Can are uh, acceptable to, uh, uh, to, the, to, to Canada, to CBSA. And then uh, there was another one, I believe, uh, this is memory. <laughs> This is my partially aging, failing memory, but so here's what it's worth. Uh, and that is that apparently they want these test results electronically too through, uh, I believe it's through Arrive Can app and also the evidence of vaccination. They, they want that electronically through the Arrive Can app. Is that what you understand? That's what I understand. Okay. Yeah. Got that right. <laughs> Love when that lines up. Well played. I, I even amaze myself sometimes, you know? <laughs> Uh, Leonard and Lorena, any other updates before we get to our guest speaker? Uh, oh, a couple things. Uh, just a reminder, when you are out boating to scan the horizons, uh, this is the time of year the humpbacks are in uh, BC and further north. And there was a report of, unfortunately, a two-year-old humpback whale was struck by a boat uh, off of Banfield or near Banfield and had propeller marks. So uh, just keep scanning the horizon, look for those blows and, and yeah. so forth. And then uh, we got a, a report. We got a report today that they were pleased to report that all three uh, transient whale pods were seen on the west side of San Juan Island. So there was some concerns that they hadn't come back in their back. They're apparently out there swimming around, having a great time. So you're absolutely right, Lorena. Keep your eyes open for them and be well wise with a safe distance to them. We also wanted to do a reminder about the Montlake uh, Bridge and the close the August 9th through September 3rd and the uh, restrictions, or not restrictions, but the uh, opening and closing, and there'll be one leaf. You can read about that in various sources, but it's just a reminder that's coming up right now here in, in August. So uh, if you're planning to go through the Montlake Cut with your boat and you need the, need the bridge opened, you better take and uh, check on the schedule on that. Lorena? I think that's it. And uh, wait, one more. Oh, you've got one more? Uh, I was gonna, oh, just to mention the, uh, <laughs> This is, uh, so we're coming back from Goddard Hot Springs today and uh, coming back to Sitka and uh, about uh, three, three or four miles out, there's a uh, sport fishing boat out there with about four or five people in it and uh, sitting in the water. Not sure what they're doing, but they're not moving. And indeed, they definitely, the, the outboard quit. They were sitting there stranded. And uh, so we ended up uh, using our tow rope again and uh, towing some people back into Sitka. Just uh, a reminder, if you're headed out with your with your boat and your outboard and whatever, just uh, get it as prepared as you can. Yeah, the, the interesting part there, Leonard, Leonard, was that you invoiced the the party for that tow, which I thought was really. <laughs> no, 
<laughs> but you know what I awesome. did? I did. They were obviously out. They were heading out to go fishing. So I said, well, do you have any fish? And they said, well, we were headed out. And I said, oh, man. I said, well, how about a crab? You know, and, <laughs> no, we haven't done any crabbing. So I said, well, OK, well, how about I owe you? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me a joke? Something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. We got them in. They were very appreciative. Yeah, we're always but, glad they help. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Nice work. The carpal work of mercy for sure. Well, um, Landon, do you want to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker? You bet. We okay. have Bob Visnor with us. He is the co-owner of Coho Hoho Rally, which takes a group of boats. Anyone's welcome, sail or power, it's mostly sail. And they cruise down the West Coast from Seattle to San Diego and San Francisco. And the camaraderie is great. It's fun. It's, it's always comforting to do that with others, with other boats. Um, Bob has a sailboat in Mexico and Bainbridge Island. Again, he's the co-owner of Coho Hoho. And we met Bob when we had our boat at Cap Sani Marina and got to know him. And uh, he makes it all happen. He's the tech guy and the manager behind uh, uh, the Coho Hoho group and, and makes sure that everything runs smoothly. And we're really excited to get more details about uh, how boaters can sign up to do this. All right. Thanks, Lorena and Leonard. Happy to be here. Happy to be here on, uh, on Wagoners. Um, yeah, so the Coho Ho Ho, uh, for people that don't know, it's, uh, it was founded in 2013 uh, after an ID in 2012 by Captain Doug Lombard. He was asked to help John and Kelly Wanamaker take their boat down to Mexico when they were found themselves at the pirate party in Anacortes and decided they didn't really quite have enough expertise. And uh, they were impressed by Doug's boat handling skills and hired him as captain to take them down. And on the way down, they said, you know, we should probably make this kind of a, a thing to help people from the Puget Sound and uh, Salish Sea <laughs> that want to hook up with the Baja Haha, which is the rally that happens every year from San Diego down to Cabo San Lucas. So they cooked up this idea and they call it the rally to get to the rally. And, uh, you know, Doug says his mission is to empty uh, Puget Sound of boats and send them all down to Mexico. So um, like Lorena said, yeah, we're all about uh, forming community, getting together a like-minded group of sailors and power boaters uh, that would like to make the trek down the coast uh, from the Puget Sound down to Mexico, enjoy the warm waters uh, down south uh, after people that have spent some time up in Alaska and, and the Northwest uh, get the, the, the urge to have a little sunshine. So like I said, the first, uh, the first year of the rally was 2013. Um, so now 2021, uh, we're still a fairly small rally compared to the Baja Haha. Um, this year we have 16 boats heading down. Our official uh, departure date is uh, August 29th, Sunday out of Port Townsend. Um, then we'll, the, the fleet will be making its way south. Um, and then most all of the fleet, uh, probably 80% of them will be hooking up with the Baja Haha, which uh, leaves the first week in November from uh, San Diego. So there's plenty of time to explore the California coast and uh, enjoy your way down. So I'm gonna pop open a quick little PowerPoint here. I'll kind of whiz through the slides. This is something that we use at the boat show uh, to introduce people. So hang on just a second. Let me share my screen. And slideshow. All right, so Coho Cruising Rally. Like I said, we call it the rally to get to the rally. So you want to do the Baja Haha, but how do I get there from here? That's what we're about. So uh, just to remind people, it's 775 miles from Seattle to San Francisco and then another 475 to San Diego, so 1,250 in total. Um, and here's how you get there. Just, just do that for seven days. So here's our motto, be safe, have fun, realize your blue water dreams. And there's John and Kelly. Those are the, uh, the inspirational couple for the Coho Ho Ho and that's their beautiful boat, Emerald Lady. Um, so back in 2013, uh, we, we used little you know, low tech paper flags on a, on a chart to track the fleet. Um, now on our website, we have an automatic fleet tracker that uh, sucks information from the Iridium Go and the Garmin InReach so we can keep track of everybody. 
And uh, there's the uh, uh, Richard Spindler, the head of the uh, the Baja, and Doug uh, Lombard, the founder of the Coho. Um, so one of the things, you know, the, one of the reasons to do the Coho, uh, this is the Baja right here, number 13, and we're way up here. We're not quite on the map yet, but, you know, this is, you know, the highway. This is the uh, Pacific Puddle Jump heading to the Marquesas. These are the AR, various ARCs. Um, so a lot of the round the world trips, people want to go to the South Pacific. They want to go through the canal, head over to the Caribbean, maybe do the Med. You know, but all of us are kind of stuck up here in the Northwest. So that was our mission of the Coho is to help people hop down the coast, hop down to Mexico, and then they can, they can hook up with their East West uh, different rallies. So a lot of people, you know, think about the big left turn, you know, people have done a lot of sailing up here in the Puget Sound and the Gulf Islands and the Salish Sea. But it's kind of scary to head out the strait and uh, make the big left turn and out into the big ocean. And it is the least shore of the world's largest ocean. So it is, you know, something not to be trifled with. Um, you can get some pretty, some pretty good swells out there. Uh, nothing like anyone's ever seen here in the inside in the sound. When those uh, big swells burr up behind you, it feels like a, you know, four story apartment building kind of rolling towards you. But on the coast, it's also, you can get beautiful sunsets. You can get some very calm weather and uh, it's very, very, very beautiful and can be very relaxing out there. So on the Coho, um, we kind of have, have three levels of participants. We've got what we call the seminar sailors, uh, people that are thinking about doing it and they just want to kind of dip their toes in it and they, uh, they can come and, and, and do our seminars for, uh, for one season. The rally runners are the people that are, are definitely going to head down. And then of course we have our alumni, the down there that have got the t-shirt done it. So what we do is we have a series of uh, 13 seminars and uh, we start those uh, in March and uh, we do them every Tuesday evening. And we, before the seminar, we have an hour long potluck. And then we have a seminar that runs from an hour to two hours, depending on the topic and the speaker. And we try and choose topics that are very educational for people, the things that they would need to know and want to know for heading down. We have a sail repair, engine maintenance, first aid, safety at sea, weather forecasting, provisioning, um, all sorts of different topics uh, that we're hoping will educate people and let them uh, you know, make good decisions on their own uh, for their trip down. We have both sail and power. It's not uh, uh, you know, relegated just to sailboats. Uh, we have uh, had two power boats go down so far. We have another power boat going this year and another power boat signed up for next year. So uh, we, we, we don't discriminate one way or another. So here's kind of a look at the, at the fleets. You know, they've kind of started out with Emerald Lady is the only one the first year. And then uh, these are kind of with the way the fleet spin every year. Last year, we had a lot of people drop out because of COVID. So we only had two boats. We called it the little fleet that could. SV Solomare went all the way down to Ecuador and Scooter was a little Hunter Vision 32. And uh, she went down, finally made it to Mexico, did uh, Sia Cortez and then, they, and then they sold her and came back. Um, so here's Roy, he's one of our uh, alumni and he's, uh, he's been stranded kind of hanging out in the South Pacific during, during COVID. Um, here's Steve Olson and Doug showing off their uh, dueling anchor, anchor tattoos. Um, and then some more of our coho people. And this uh, boat up here, this is Agatha. Uh, this is a Beneteau 40, Oceanus 45 that uh, my wife Pam and I had the good fortune to be crew on in 2018. Uh, we helped them uh, head down the coast on the Seattle to San Francisco leg. Um, and the other thing we do is for our fleet um, is besides our seminars, uh, I forgot to mention, we also have two field trips every year. We have one to Port Townsend, one to Anacortes. And Port Townsend, uh, we get a tour of the Port Townsend rigging, rigging loft. And Port Townsend rigging will do a complimentary uh, rigging inspection to one lucky coho boat. Um, and then we also get a tour of the Northwest Maritime Center. And uh, usually it works out that we can go up and play with their simulators. They have radar training simulators. And then they have this really cool uh, nav station simulator that they've used to train people on big boats um, for piloting into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, as well as they also have all of the computer simulations for coming into San Francisco Bay. Um, so you can kind of get a preview of what it's going to be like to approach the Bay Bridge, the, the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, where the potato patch is 
bridges, uh, see all the buoys leading you in the channel into San Francisco Harbor. Um, and then for our fleet on the way down, uh, what we do for everyone is we provide uh, customized weather forecasts. We go and check and see what NOAA's got to say and check a couple of different uh, sources. And then we forward on weather forecasts to the fleet, uh, the specific to their location uh, during their way down. And then we're also available by the Iridium Go and the InReach to provide any short size services we need in case they need us to run down a part for them or help them uh, get some reservations at a marina or hotel or whatever. Um, everyone, like I said, uh, our big thing is everyone has to be their own captain. We don't have a committee boat that leads everybody down. Um, everyone is their own captain on the way down. Uh, we try and empower everybody with knowledge and training uh, from the seminars and from the camaraderie of each other to be your own captain, make your own decisions and decide what's best for your boat and your crew. But one of the things we do suggest is to uh, stop halfway in Newport. It's one of the easier bar crossings on the Pacific coast. The Rogue Brewery is right in the marina. Um, and the Aquina Bay Yacht Club is great fun and they're super nice and super friendly. Uh, the year we went down 2018, we hooked up with the Aquina Bay Yacht Club on their uh, racing night. And so a couple of us went uh, crew to race with them and then we traded some burgies with them. Um, and then we headed back out. This is uh, SV Lee Ann. Um, they were um, sailing with us, they're buddy boating with us this year. And you can see, you know, you're on top of the waves, you're below the waves. Uh, so this is this is kind of what to expect out there, you know, with the with the swells out on the Pacific. And then, of course, the big deal is you get to San Francisco. I mean, there's nothing like the feeling of sailing under the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, it's a uh, it's a signature moment for, for most people to get down there. So now you've done the hard part and that's you know what most people you know are worried about, most people are fretting about and they spend all this time thinking about it, preparing for it, getting their boat ready for it. Um, really, if you think about it, it's only about seven sailing days from Seattle to San Francisco. It usually takes longer because you end up having to lay up for weather or for other things. Um, you know, we tell most people to uh, a lot, two weeks for the trip from Seattle to San Francisco. Um, I think the fastest anyone's ever done it on the coho is three days, but it was a 65 foot sailboat that motored the whole way. So, um, but generally about seven days. So you've done the hard part and now you're down in San Francisco and you should enjoy yourself. There's so many fun things to do in San Francisco. There's a bunch of different anchorages to check out. Uh, some people happen to be there for uh, the, uh, the America's Cup one year, which is great fun. And then they have Fleet Week when they've got all sorts of tall ships and, and uh, military aircraft running around. And then south of San Francisco is one thing we tell people is that, okay, you know, most people are focused to get from Seattle to San Francisco, Seattle to San Francisco, the hard part out in the ocean. Um, but you got to prepare. There's all sorts of fun stuff south of San Francisco, Channel Islands, Catalina, Monterey Bay. Um, and then once you get south of San Francisco, you really don't have to do overnight passages anymore. You can do day hops from place to place. Um, you can go to Avalon and Catalina. Uh, Doug has been trying to uh, organize an annual putt-putt golf tournament on Catalina. Uh, we'll see if that materializes this year. It's usually in early October. And then uh, there's tons of wildlife, of course, to see, you know, whales, uh, mola mola, valella, all sorts of interesting wildlife. A lot of this wildlife you didn't used to see up here, but um, now with global warming, you are seeing it more. I've been seeing a lot of the mola mola off the west coast of Vancouver Island lately. And don't forget fishing. Um, there's pretty good fishing out there, uh, mostly tuna when you're off of uh, Northern California, Oregon coast. Uh, so make sure you bring some hand lines to troll behind you. If you like to eat fish, uh, you will probably catch one um, and they are mighty good eating. Oh, just one thing on, uh, that I discovered, someone asked me this question on fishing licenses. So I'll pass this along. If you are offshore, which means more than three miles off the coast, um, you're in federal waters. And so uh, as far as fishing licenses go, any state fishing license from Oregon, Washington, any coastal state, your fishing license is good in federal offshore waters. So once you get more than three miles offshore, um, if you've got a Washington state fishing license, you're good all the way down to San Francisco. Of course, once you come inshore inside of three miles, then you are required to have the state fishing license. Um, 
And then heading down, also, it's a good time. Uh, you stop in San Francisco, Monterey, San Diego. Good place to do some those last minute projects you didn't quite get to be, get to before you left Seattle. Um, one thing, there's a lot of great, cheap, inexpensive, uh, skilled craftsmen in Mexico uh, to do a lot of projects, but it's really hard to get uh, high tech gear there. So electronics for navigation, water makers, any of those kind of stuff, uh, I'd recommend that you, you know, get those done um, while you're still in the States. Um, if, and even if you don't have a chance to put them in, if you at least buy the parts and then truck them down with you. Lots of great sunny beaches, you know, the weather gets warm, the further south you get. And then Mexico beyond here is uh, one of the coho couples, uh, they were heading to the South Pacific. And these are some of the photos they took as they crossed the equator and went from uh, polywogs to shellbacks. Um, and you'll see some pictures of, of, of these people later, Lars and Lara. So getting back to the coho season. So we always start off with a big kickoff party. Uh, this year it had to be online, but usually we have it in the courtyard of fisheries. We have a salmon bake, um, lots of beer uh, donated by our, one of our sponsors, Maritime Pacific Brewing Company. And then we kick off our seminar series right after that, uh, usually in mid-March. Like I said, 5.30 potluck, 8.30 seminar, all sorts of topics. Um, and you can keep up with us on our website and we also have a Facebook page. Um, kids welcome, the food at the potluck is great. Like I say, a lot of our, our mission is to help foster community and get a group of like-minded sailors who are thinking about, you know, heading down to Mexico because um, you'll learn as much from each other as you will from us. And the more you can form a community of people that you can buddy boat with. And as well, since we have people that are leaving this year, next year, two years from now, four years from now, it's a great pool to draw crew from. And there's a lot of people that are thinking about heading down in three or four years, and they would love to have the experience of being crew this year. And if they've gone through the seminars, you know, you know that they have more knowledge than your, your average person off the street. And you've probably also had a chance to, you know, have dinner with them several times and get to know them. And since we have, uh, we have, besides our um, field trips, we also have two raft ups during the year where we all get together, either Blakely Harbor or Liberty Bay or somewhere nearby. And that gives you a good chance uh, to meet other people and also to sail with people. You can invite people to be crew just for the weekend. So uh, not too much of a commitment to get to know how you like living with someone in a small space. Then the seminars, we get people that are experts in their field. This is Lisa Vizzini from uh, Port Townsend Rigging, talking about rigging inspection, what to look for on your rig before you head offshore. Um, uh, this was a, a women's panel we had of experienced women sailors. Uh, Captain Skip Anderson from, um, uh, oh shoot, what's his company? Anyway, he's down in Tacoma. He has a captain school. Um, down there. So he talks all about what it means to be a captain, uh, whether or not you want to get your captain's license. Um, Ballard Sales does a whole seminar on sail repair, um, talking about what to look for on your sails before you go and some uh, repair strategies and some materials to have on hand while you go. Safety at sea, uh, safety equipment, as well as some great stories about safety at sea. Um, then we got Dr. Ken Favorite up there, gave us some, some medical uh, uh, tips. Field trips, like I said, we have to Port Townsend rigging. Uh, one of the, the riggers there will go with the mast and do a full rigging inspection uh, while the rest of the group watches and listens to the commentary, get a tour of the rigging shop. Um, and like you see here, we, we do it right next to the haul out dock up at Port Townsend. So uh, the rigger can be up the mast and the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the crew uh, could be watching from the dock. And then here's the uh, the simulator at Maritime at the Northwest Maritime Center. So you, you know, feel like you're behind the uh, behind the wheel of a big ship. Um, and then some years uh, when we do our Anacortes field trip, we can have uh, a little diesel mechanics class. They give an old diesel engine they let us tear apart, give people people some experience pulling out the impellers from an old old stuck water pump. And then uh, we usually try if we can we find uh, an expired life raft and and pop it open. Uh, to, to see what happens. Um, and then of course, the, you know, the field trips are also another chance to get together to share food and share some drinks and get to know each other, tell tales of woe about how your boat projects are going or not growing, um, have our raft ups. Um, like I said, here's a bunch of boats over in Blakely Harbor a couple years ago. 
And this gives us a chance to test out our inReaches and our Iridium Goes when we're out of the marina to make sure our communications are working for each other. And again, we can try out recipes on each other, uh, get to know each other. So um, besides our, our, our seminars, our field trips and raft ups, uh, once the seminar season wrapped up, wraps up, uh, then for the fleet that's leaving this year, the current year, we have captains meetings every Tuesday. So a small group of captains uh, really gets down to the nitty gritty, which way are you going? Where are you gonna stop? Uh, are you gonna fuel up here or there? Are you gonna go out far? Are you gonna harbor hop? Talk about finding a crew, start watching the weather. Um, and then, like I said, we have fleet tracking on our website and then we do weather routing assistance to, to San Francisco. Um, and we, we do really recommend uh, the inReach has been our, our, um, our uh, communication uh, device of choice. Uh, we have opened it up to do the Iridium Go since that's becoming very popular and both of them work for us. And then here's our fleet tracking. So if you go on our website, you'll find our tracking page. It has a list of all the boats for this year. You can click on all or some of them and see how they're making progress. You can see here, there's a very uh, wide range. You know, we've got the boats that harbor hop and stick in close to shore. And then we got the boats that head off to the edge of the shelf and stay out as far as they can until they head in. This guy, um, they just decided to skip San Francisco, San Francisco altogether and they headed straight to Monterey. Um, and then when we send people off, uh, like I said, people, uh, you know, we encourage people to, you know, be your own captain, make your own decisions. And so people are not limited to leave right exactly at the time that we set. Although we'd strongly encourage people if it's possible to do that, because it's much more fun to sail with a group of people and you have the mutual support. You have people that are, you know, not that far ahead or behind of you. So you can uh, talk to them on VHF if they're close enough, or if not, you can talk to them on the inReach and find out, you know, what's the weather down there, you know, in Oregon. Uh, you know, or up north, is there something coming that we should be aware of? Um, so if you do participate in our uh, our departure ceremony, we do a blessing of the fleet where we uh, offer libations to all the gods of the sea. And then we do a ceremonial line cutting. We have a sacrificial dock line. That's the last line holding you to shore. You cut that and you head off. If it's Port Townsend, you head off into the fog <laughs> more, more often than not. And then, uh, make your way out the strait in search of beautiful sunsets and warm weather. And so here's Lars and Lara again. They are the ones that were doing uh, the uh, equator crossing ceremony. So we say, here's the coho changes people. Here's uh, Lara and Lars and Susan. They, they're sitting at a seminar in March and here they are in the South Pacific. And, uh, and here's Susan in Hawaii, uh, you know, much, they're, they're blonder, they're, they're happier, they're tanner, and uh, they're smiling a lot more than they were. So here's where we're all hoping to find. We're hoping to find that secluded anchorage in Baja where the sun's shining and you're the only one in the bay. Um, you can go on the website and find out about registration. Um, and you can go online and follow our events. And uh, this is our little our registration page. Um, and all the events are there and you can also uh, keep track of what's going on on the website. We got a bunch of great sponsors and supporters uh, from local companies uh, that we just couldn't do this without. So like we say, be your own captain, make your own decisions, be safe, have fun and realize your blue water dreams. So that is my quick run through of the coho. So uh, this year, little, little report, we got 16 boats. Um, I think of the 1610 are leaving out of Port Townsend on uh, Sunday, August 29th. The rest are planning to leave uh, sometime. It varies within the two weeks before that. A few people have some, you know, crew. Uh, people could only get time off from work, you know, at a certain time. So that's kind of the, the, the quick and dirty of it. Any questions, guys? Thanks. Well, thank you, Bob. That was invigorating and inspirational. <laughs> so that, yeah, you've got my attention and uh, the 39 other folks on the on the call right now. Any questions from the audience or Landon, do you have any questions for Bob or Mark? Bunzel, well, I should sounds, ask. sounds like uh, there's some flexibility there as far as what voters do. Uh, some might take more time. How many folks go into the river bars and tour around on the way down? Um, most people make at least one stop. And, you know, it's like, like we say, it's kind of like uh, whether you stay in close to shore or you go offshore, you know, 60, 70, 80 miles, you know, follow the shelf down. It's like we like to say, it's kind of a, a religious question. It's kind of similar to, you know, which is the best anchor um, when you start debating those things. Uh, you know, different people have very different opinions. Um, 
you know, I've gone into several of the bars down the coast um, and been pretty lucky. It's been a little scary a few times, but, you know, always made it, of course. I, I guess, you know, the one collocation is that if it gets nasty out there, then they close the bars or the bars are nasty to cross. And if you're too far out, you know, it'll take you a while to get in and get to a bar. Um, but if you're far enough out, maybe you don't need to cross it. So, um, and like I said, it's a religious question. People have very strong opinions either way. Um, you know, you, you talk to five people, you get 10 different answers about, uh, about which way to do it. Um, I know that the people on SV Totem, Jamie and Behan Gifford, uh, they're proponents of staying in close. If you talk to uh, the Hydrovane kids, uh, I'm forgetting their names now, um, you know, they're proponents of, of, going, of going far offshore. So... So, Been there, done that. We uh, we went down the coast and weather got nasty, and we headed into a bar. The bars were closing, and we made it in before they close it to the larger boats. So yeah, yeah, and well, it, yeah. I was going to ask. So as the coho ho ho, I noticed that in your list of the boats, it was all SV. Are you, uh, is it exclusively sailboats? Or oh, no, is... no, no, we, we welcome motorboats. We've had a couple motorboats in the past. We don't get a lot of them because I don't think that many motorboats head down the coast. Um, we have one this year, um, Jim and Rosie Addington, and I'm just, I'm spacing on the name of the boat right now. I'm sorry. Um, and then we have another one signed up for next year. And we have another boat that's um, not necessarily part of, the, they're sort of part of the coho there. Um, they'll be joining us there a little further south in Oregon right now. And they're going to pop out and, and join the fleet as they go by. So no, we are not sailboat exclusive at all. We, we welcome power boats and we'd, we'd love to get more. And they're actually nice to have along with the fleet because, you know, they have a little, uh, they can move along a little faster. And so if someone does get in trouble, it's a little easier for them to, to get in there. So. But speaking of bars, I was going to make, make one recommendation. It's like anyone heading down the coast, uh, two publications you got to get. You got to get Charlie's Charts of the Coast, and you got to get the Coast Pilot. The Coast Pilot is the Bible. It has detailed information of every single you know, bar crossing and port down the coast, as, long as, as well as a ton of other information. Charlie's Charts is, I think, a little more readable and a little more conversational, and it's also more entertaining. And um, one of my favorite uh, passages from, from Charlie's charts is, oh, oh shoot, you know, I, I'm with you, Leonard. My, my memory is, is keeps, uh, <laughs> keeps, keeps failing me here. The, the, the smallest port on the West Coast in Oregon, um, oh, what's it called? Oh. Depot, Depot Bay. Bay. Depot Bay. Depot Bay. Yeah. So their description of Depot Bay, they they talk about it. It's, it's a it's a one of the charmingest, ch most charming small ports on the Pacific coast. It's a short, narrow approach with a little bend in the middle, and there's a there's a low bridge just after you do the bend. And, and they say uh, if you're successful at navigating the bar and the entrance and the bridge, you'll be uh, treated to one of the most delightful little po ports on the West Coast. If you're unsuccessful, the bus station is a short walk up the highway. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's very good. That, that's very correct and very apt, yes. So uh, there was a, a question here. Okay. Peter, did, did you... you know, I think we got it. Uh... We, the question about the website, which I've included, um, John's yep. asking if there's any opportunities to help crew and boats down or back until you reach. Yeah. So yes, yeah. so if you go on the website, there's a crew finder section and you can sign up there and put in your information uh, if you're interested in being crew or if you're looking for crew. Um, and then you're also welcome to just post anything on our, our so we have a public coho ho ho um, Facebook page that anyone can go to. And then for people that are registered members, we have a private group. Um, that we uh, use for uh, communicating amongst ourselves and uh, for uh, coordinating private events and things like that. So, um, and I'd like to say that, you know, the, you know when you join the Coho Ho Ho with a rally runner level, uh, it's a lifetime membership. Um, you can never uh, quit. There's no way to get out of it. Um, and so you can come back and take classes year after year after year. I mean, you can take classes for five, six years, as long as you want. You can do the Coho and then come back. We've had two people repeat. Uh, they went down the coast. Um, uh, one person was scared of Mexico, so they went down the coast and went to Hawaii and then came back. And then they got up their courage a couple of years later and they went down the coast and down to Mexico. And we had another couple that went to New Zealand and sold the boat um, and then came back and did family things for a couple of years. And then they bought another boat and joined the coho again and, and went back down. And, uh, and you can join anytime. And then actually, you know, you can, you can, like I said, you can join as a rally runner. And you don't have to go this year. You can go four years from now and just uh, you know keep doing the classes every year. We try and make the classes a little bit different each year because we know that we do have some you know repeat attendees. Mark, you're being awfully. 
Oh, go ahead. I was going Claire. to mention we did participate with the Baja Haha. We were one of three powerboats with 200 and some <laughs> sailboats. Yep, but I yep. think they appreciated it because the we'd get radio calls, you know, for spare parts. So it was fun. It, it, we had a ball. It was a great group of people, lots of fun, and everybody supported one another. It was fabulous. And I know the Coho Hohos is the same way where the camaraderie and the yeah, and, and the nice thing, if you are planning to do the uh, the Baja, um, you know, it's nice to kind of have a group, a small group, you know, like say if you have 12 to 16 boats, you know, that go down in the Coho, and then you're in the Baja where there's 180 boats, you know, you kind of already have your own little tribe of, of Cohoers, and, and really, if you've come down from Seattle to San Diego, I mean, the Baja is, is, is really nothing, and, you know, people are going, oh my God, the weather's coming up, it's 15 knots of wind. Um, you know, <laughs> if all the coho are like, good, we, good sailing has finally arrived. Yeah. yeah, it's much easier to get south of San Francisco yeah. or yeah. to San Francisco and the rest is but very I, easy. But all that said, I'll, I'll put in a big vote for if you've ever thought about doing that or even if you haven't thought about going to Mexico uh, with your boat, do it. Uh, seriously put it on your agenda, your bucket list, because it's spectacular. You had a great picture of of an anchorage there in the Sea of Cortez and mm -hmm. the boat there and brought back fond memories of that. And it's spectacular. Oh Wonderful. yeah, no, it is beautiful. And, and uh, another thing that I always tell people is a lot of people that they're on a, uh, they're on a, have an agenda, you know, they're going to go down, you know, in, in August, they're going to hook up with the Baja in November and they're going to head down to Cabo. Then they're going to hop across to Mazatlan and go down and they're going to do the Pacific puddle jump in April. And they're just go, 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 go. And it's like, you know, um, you know Mexico is amazing and wonderful. And uh, I, I wouldn't race through Mexico. Um, you know, I, I would really encourage people to spend a full season at least and don't just, you know, go there for a couple months. Uh, I agree. Uh, it, it is spectacular. And, and I, I think we've all gotten spoiled in the Northwest of going North because it's gorgeous. But uh, Mexico is kind of the opposite and warm and dry kind of desert instead of rocks and, and trees. But it's got its own beauty. It, it is just fabulous. And I, I agree with you, Bob. And I, I think the program that you're, you're doing is just fantastic. We run flotillas up, up to Alaska and we have so much fun uh, with the group and getting to know each other. And we become lifelong friends. I, I still get calls and emails from people that went on my first flotilla about 10 years ago. So yeah. uh, I, I hats off to you for doing this. I know it's uh, a labor of love and thank you so much for doing it. Oh yeah. Yeah. And we actually, we actually moved our, our departure date back uh, about three weeks because uh, there are a lot of people that wanted to do your flotilla or uh, Jim Rars flotilla up to Alaska. I like, everyone's right. like, Oh, I'm going to Mexico, but I've never been to Alaska yet. It's like, my last chance to get to Alaska before I leave. And so uh, we, we train and, and we moved it back a little bit. So give people a chance to, you know, head up in the spring to Alaska and spend you know, the, the summer there and then be able to come back down and then, and then head down to Mexico. Well, I appreciate you doing that. And, and we'll, we'll stay in coordination on our dates and, yep. and cross promote. I mean, I think it'd be fantastic <laughs> to come back from Alaska and just keep right on going right yep. down the coast. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Uh, your slide with the cost went by pretty quickly. Uh, uh, what is the cost for the three different levels? Yeah, so we got uh, six ninety five for the Rally Runner lifetime subscription and two ninety nine for the uh, uh, single season uh, seminar sailor, which gets you to you know, one year's events. Um, but I encourage everybody. Uh, we run a boat so boat show special every year. Um, so we, you know, knock a hundred bucks off during the boat show. Um, cause we get, you know, we, a lot of people go to our seminars and hear about us there. And so we encourage people to sign up at the boat show and we always discount it then. So, and then also if you're just hearing about us, if you missed all the seminars, um, you know, a lot of people don't hear about us in time. Uh, so we also have a, you know, a sliding scale prorated for people that, you know, if they didn't, weren't able to partake the seminars, but they still want to hook up and have some of the support down the coast. Uh, they can always just give us a, just drop us a line and email and we'll do a prorated uh, membership for people so Fantastic. and yes yeah, yeah if you want any information it's just info 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 at coho ho ho dot com and that's our general information uh, email and they can just just send that to us so yeah i'll uh, i'll type that into the uh into the chat i here. got it for you bob oh you got it okay yeah. thanks 
Yeah, John Rongren, uh, who's watching tonight, he asked that question a little earlier, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I know what John does for a living, and I'm thinking, John, I think you're starting school uh, around that time. So, uh, uh, John, you're going to have to put this off until you're retired. He's a neighbor of ours, Nana Cortez, and a and, uh, good friend, and he's involved with the, uh, with the school program, school systems up here. Yeah. Well, I'm happy, but, like I say, uh, he'll take- be doing it, I'm sure. Yeah, sometimes it takes people a while. We have a coho uh, boat from 2015, I think, 2015, who's finally going down this year. He's been threatening to go down for several years, and he's finally making the jump. And you know what? His projects are not finished yet. Imagine that. Isn't that the way it always works? (laughs) That's the reality. And thank you for bringing that up, because uh, if you keep saying, I'm going to go next year when everything's finished, You'll never go. No, nope, so nope. and there's that's and there's fantastic. Yeah, you know, well, you know, cruising is just doing boat projects in exotic places, right? Exactly. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. But I will say, if you if you do have projects, uh, Dave so, Ryan, I was gonna say, save your stainless for Mexico. It's so much cheaper there. Yeah, <laughs> Dave like Ryan just asked a question. What about coming home? How do we what? get home after we've been on the the Coho? Um, I would say v- very few people come back home um, from that. So, uh, so let's see. This year we did have a boat uh, that went down in the 2018 fleet to Scanso. Uh, they just shipped their boat home on a freighter, so that's a possibility. Um, you can get. I think it leaves out of is it out of Loreto, um, or uh, yeah, or, yeah. So I believe it is out of Loreto. Yeah, so you can ship your boat back. If your boat's not too big, you can truck it back, although not from Mexico. You can truck it back from Southern California. I've had a couple of people that have done the Baja Bash back up the, uh, the peninsula and then had it trucked back from San Diego. Um, we had one poor guy. He made it to San Francisco, and he said, this is not for me. And he put his boat on a truck, and I think his boat got back to Seattle before people got to San Diego. Um, and then, but if you want to sail back, I mean, I have, uh, there's one person that hired a delivery captain to motor it back up north up the coast for him. Um, a couple people have sailed to Hawaii and then come back over the top of the North, the North Pacific High. Um, several people have, like I said, they've, they've gone all the way across the Pacific and sold their boat and then come back and then bought another boat. Um, but if you do want to bring your boat back north, you kind of have, you know, three or four options. You can have it uh, shipped on the freighter from Mexico. Um, or I believe you can also, we had another person that shipped their boat back from Costa Rica. I believe they're in, I think it is, um, in Central America. Um, if you want to bash back up to San Diego, you can put it on a, on a truck if it's small enough and truck it back up. Uh, you can pay a captain or you can do the, um, you know, the torture yourself of motoring and bashing back up north. Or you can sail to Hawaii and, and come back. Those are kind of your options for getting back if you come back through the Panama and uh, head over to the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Nope. That's right. Yeah, we don't we don't have as many boats do the Panama, but we have had several boats go through the Panama Canal and, and head over to the Caribbean. Um, we had one boat that uh, actually head over and they went across uh, the Atlantic over over to the Med. Yeah. This is this has been fantastic and I really appreciate again, what you're doing and, and presenting this to us and uh, appreciate coming on uh, for uh, what will be our closing program. Oh. Uh, we're going on hiatus for a month. We are going to be back. We're, we're, we're out cruising and uh, our connections get tougher. So uh, we're going to be uh, taking a month off and we'll be back. Uh, Lorena, what is it? September back. 8th, we're coming back. Is that correct? September 9th, Thursday, September 9th. And we have Mike Lovell with us with Anacortes Yacht Charter. So, and actually, that's how we started out boating when our sons were growing up, the little pikes. We would charter a boat, and it was great because you could try out different makes and brands and, and gain experience and then figure out what type of boat you wanted. So, uh, they'll be with us on the ninth. And then uh, we have an uh, interesting guest on the 16th, Malcolm Harker. He um, uh, took a fireboat, a British fireboat, and turned it into a beautiful pleasure boat. So we're going to learn about that as well. 
This is somebody we ran into, uh, met at, uh, up in uh, False, uh, False Creek, up in Vancouver area, and uh, tied up next to them. And uh, they gave us a grand tour of this converted boat, this very large boat, this fire boat that he's converted into a recreational boat. It's fabulous. He's got an interesting story about the converging in this boat. So we've got a great season starting up in September. Looks like uh, Mark's already gotten started on his August vacation as his uh, <laughs> battery died. Couldn't wait to, <laughs> and I am out of here. Uh, no, well, no, I'm looking forward to uh, season three. I think of Seattle Boat Show Live. Are you, uh, Landon, are you watching any of the sailing in the Olympics? Are you watching any of that action? Uh, no, there's. <laughs> we would like to. Uh, we're laughing because the the uh, TV the Sitka. Here, the uh, cell phone signal sometimes just totally goes away, and the same with the over-the-airwaves TV. And so we're, we get pieces of it, but then every now and then the TV just goes away, and, ah. and there's nothing. <laughs> you can't get oh, any wow. signal. Well, I, I read a neat article about this brother team from Croatia and how they they realized their dream by starting by building a boat when they were younger. So I'll put that in the chat, and there is some live sailing going on this evening, 10.30 uh, p.m., as everyone goes to bed, uh, no, but 10.30 p.m. tonight, um, there'll be some sailing activity uh, on one of the channels, maybe USA. Uh, so, yeah, quite exciting. Yeah, so so speaking of, of connectivity and getting... Uh, Bob's you know, back! Bob, no! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I just, I'm just going to chime in here. Uh, uh, you know, if you're interested in, uh, you know, connectivity and, you know, getting a cell service on board, we got two seminars on communication offshore, and we got a couple uh, uh, resources in our group to help people with uh, cell boosters and Wi-Fi boosters and satellite. And so, um, you know, if that's something you're looking at, uh, either for either just staying in touch with people or uh, if you want to work off your boat, uh, that's uh, two of our seminars and, uh, you know, good resources. So um, check us out for that. Yeah. I'll count that as a plug. Nice work there, Bob. Well, he's out of here. We're dropping like flies. Well, you know, Leonard, I was reading the news this past week. Did you hear Leonard that the, the Norway is going to start putting barcodes on their Navy ships? No. Yeah, I know. It's unbelievable. When they get into port, then it allows them to Scandinavian. <laughs> ow, 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 ow. No, I that one. Improving. Yeah, okay. You never, it's funny what you read. Well, I want to thank everyone for sticking with us for the hour. Bob, thanks so much. Mark's already gone. And Landon, it's great to see you. Have a safe yeah, month. Good to see you. Good to see you. Okay. Have we're a good gonna, August. Thank you. We're going to try. Um, let's see if I can get the taps or the colors from Roche Harbor uh, going like we do. If not, uh, let's see what we got here. Um, let's see second as i twist this dial here uh bam got that gerbils keeping us going here share screen right, i'm ready to stand and salute okay here we go here we go share sound all right let's do it all right good night everyone Good night. thanks everybody good afternoon air harbor master of roach harbor welcome talk to you a little bit today about the color ceremony of our Roach Harbor Resort. Our color ceremony was started by the late Reuben Tart, founder of Roach Harbor as a resort in 1956, with the first color ceremony going off in 1957. Our color staff uh, consists of four to five dock staff that do the color ceremony every evening, 10 minutes before sunset. They'll march out to Colonel Bogey's March to the flags, uh, where they promptly take down the Roach Harbor Burgey first, and then they'll take down the Washington State flag, and then take down the Canadian flag, and then followed last by the British flag, and then the American flag comes down with a salute to colors by a cannon, and then place taps. In Roach Harbor, please come and join us for our time-honored celebration. We look forward to sharing this experience with all of the boaters here at Roach Harbor. 
and have a safe and happy boating season.